Good morning. Our reading today is from Galatians chapter 3 and verses 7 through to 22. Faith or works of the law. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, it is written. Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, so that by faith, we might receive the promise of the spirit, the law and the promise. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established. So it is in this case, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it is no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin, so that what is promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Amen. Well, hello and welcome back to our series in Galatians. My question for us this morning is, what do we rely on? What do we rely on? And specifically, what do we rely on for our salvation and our relationship with God? Now, we know the answer to that question, don't we? We rely on Jesus. We rely on his death and his rising again. That's it. But is this really what we rely on? Or maybe, is this really all we rely on. I think there's a risk, I certainly have this risk as a Christian, of subconsciously also relying on something else, something I can do, something I can contribute. Yes, I know Jesus' death and resurrection makes me right with God, but there must be some things in my column, surely, that I need to, you know, contribute as well. It could be like a strict devotional practice, you know, half an hour of prayer and Bible reading, each morning. It could be giving a certain amount away to church or charities. Maybe it's resistance to certain sins, certain temptations. I have to avoid these. Or maybe it's having a, you know, a positive, honourable reputation among other people, something to maintain. Now, none of these are bad things, of course. But the question is, do we rely on them? Do we rely on our ability to do these things, to to shore up our salvation, our holiness, our relationship with God? 
maybe even subconsciously, even without thinking? Or do we genuinely rely on Jesus' death and resurrection alone? And this is important, I think, because it changes how we view those good things we do. See, if I do you know, daily Bible reading and prayer, knowing it's a, a wonderful way to relate to God, it, it can bring me joy and freedom. But if I do it in the belief that my salvation or my right standing in God's eyes is even slightly dependent on my good practice, well, then it can become a task of duty or of fear with a lot of pressure on my own ability to satisfy this requirement. So what do you rely on? It might feel this morning like I'm starting at the end of the sermon, but I want to start with this because I want to show how important today's passage is. It's quite a complex, rich theological passage, but it has wonderful relevance for our lives. As Paul continues his rebuke of the Galatian churches, here he rebukes them for relying on things other than Jesus. So I want us to hear that warning and ask that question as I go through. What do we rely on? Well, in Galatians, Paul's big issue is a distortion of the gospel brought about by some false teachers and a particular distortion of adding things to the gospel, things like circumcision and other Jewish practices from the Old Testament. And so Paul is emphatic, isn't he? We saw this a couple of weeks ago. Add nothing to the gospel. Add nothing. And in today's passage, Paul wants to draw upon this by looking at Jewish history. Now, you might think, well, Jewish history feels like probably a strong suit of his opponents, and they're all about Jewish customs and practice. But no, Paul shows today that even Old Testament history makes it clear that Christians should add nothing to the gospel. And in his quick survey of Jewish history, which we'll do now, he starts with Abraham. Abraham was the patriarch of the Jewish nation, a wandering nomad who was called by God to be the father of a great nation. And as God interacted with Abraham through Genesis, God makes incredible promises to him. At the heart of the promise is that Abraham would be the father of a great nation, a great people. Let me read the first iteration of this promise. Genesis chapter 12, I'll read from verse 2 to 3. God says, to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Let's hear that last bit again. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. See, the promise here of making Abraham into a great nation, a great people group, it doesn't end there. God says, I'm going to use you as well to bless all peoples, all nations on earth. From the very start, the first time God speaks to Abraham, and the first time he says, you're going to be a wonderful, great nation, the people of Israel, he's also looking forward to the broader work. All peoples, all nations, all nationalities and tribes will be blessed through God's work in Abraham. So God makes this wonderful promise to Abraham. What's Abraham's response? Well, it's the proper response to a promise. If someone promises you something, I promise you I will be there at a certain time. I'm not really asking you to do anything, am I? I'm just asking you to believe my promise, to trust in it, to believe what I've said. That's all God wants from Abraham. From this nomadic man who had no children, God promised to make into a great nation, a nation that would bless all the other nations. God is making a promise. He's not making a deal here. He's not saying, you do this, I'll do that. He's not asking for payment. If you cough up the dough, Abraham, then I'll give you what you're after. No, it's a promise. He just wants Abraham to believe him, to trust him. And that's what happens. Genesis 15, 6, we read, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited, credited it to him as righteousness. And this belief of Abraham, this faith, this trust in God's promises. This is where Paul kicks in today. Let me read from Galatians 3, 6 and 7. So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Paul says Abraham had faith, belief in God's promises, 
So all who have faith are also children of Abraham. Paul's making a key point here. He says the real children of Abraham, the the true people of God even, are not actually the ethnic Jewish people, but those who, like Abraham, respond in faith. And Paul's got excellent grounds for this. As we just saw uh, in those promises in Genesis 12, God's plan was to bless all the nations, all the different people, including non-Jewish people, Gentiles, through Abraham. So in Galatians 3.9, back in our passage, we read, so those who rely on faith are blessed with Abraham, the man of faith. Now, this might seem very uncontroversial to us. We are used to faith being the key criteria for belonging to God. But Paul was making explicit here what some of those Jewish Christians in the Galatian churches probably didn't really like to hear, that their ethnic heritage wasn't really what made them God's people. No, it was their faith that made them God's children. Just like Abraham, the man of faith, the man God would use to bless all sorts of people. And this would have been very encouraging for the Gentile Christians in the Galatian churches, the non-Jewish Christians. Very encouraging for them to read. Paul's saying, making explicit what they believed might have been nervous to say. Paul says, yes, your faith means you're in Abraham's line. And I want to say we should be encouraged by this too. Again, it's probably not controversial to us. You know, we know the song, don't we? Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. And so are you. But this is the passage this catchy kid's song draws from. All who follow Jesus, all believers in Jesus, can legitimately be called sons of Abraham. Now, I don't have Jewish background. I can't claim to be a child of Abraham through Jewish heritage. Not like the same way I can claim to be a son or a descendant of Jean Palot, my, you know, my ancestor who came here. No, the only way I can sing the song that I'm a, a child of Abraham is if what Paul says is true. If faith is the criteria, faith like Abraham means I belong to Abraham's line, Abraham's people, the people of God. So far, so good, I think. Well, now Paul mentions the law. This is the big issue here. The law is the basis of the false teacher's emphasis. These false teachers to these Galatian churches were suggesting that Gentile believers, non-Jewish background Christians, should also be following certain Jewish laws. Uh, Circumcision, food laws, maybe Sabbath observance, key markers of Jewish identity. Well, here in Galatians, the letter, Paul reminds everyone the law was introduced about 430 years after those promises to Abraham. The law came under Moses at Mount Sinai, a long time later. And while God's original promises to Abraham were received by faith, the law is about performance. Chapter 3, verse 12. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. The law is about performance. Paul's, Paul's language is the person who does these things. It's about doing In our last series in this church in Exodus, uh, we had a look at some of the law. The law was given by God for the people to follow so they could have a closer relationship with God. And you might recall the the detail, the complexity of the law, and ultimately, its impossibility. And the law was very realistic about this too. Inbuilt into the law were sacrifices you were supposed to offer when you failed it, not if you failed it. No, when you fail. This was the issue with the law. It's what Paul here refers to as the curse of the law. It was based on performance, but nobody could perform it perfectly. But this was what the people had to do. Keeping the law was the basis of the relationship with God. It wasn't optional, opting out of the law. No, throughout Jewish history, they had to keep on keeping it. And yet they would keep on failing. You can just imagine them, head hung, traipsing back to the tabernacle, later the temple, offering their sacrifice to you know, be received back into God's people. It worked, kind of, but ultimately they would have felt like a failure. And, and you know, they go home, clean start. But of course, next week, next month, they'd be back again, despite their best, best efforts with another sacrifice. Yes, I failed again. Here's my sacrifice. It's like that old joke, kind of, you know, practice makes perfect, people say. 
But then nobody's perfect. So why practice? It's like a cycle, isn't it? God's people were committed to keeping the law, but they couldn't keep it perfectly. So they had to keep offering sacrifices and keep trying to keep the law again. Paul describes this as the curse of the law, Galatians 3.10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it's written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. It's a trap, a cycle. Once you're relying on it, you're under this curse of never getting it completely right and so always being a bit of a failure. I don't know if you can relate to this feeling. Maybe you've signed up for some kind of system that requires discipline, maybe a fitness routine or a reading plan, a strict diet, maybe even a spiritual discipline target. Maybe it's a plan you were given by someone or one that you set yourself. And if you set a a target that's too challenging, you're kind of setting yourself up for failure, aren't you? I've done this. I still do it at the start of most weeks. I'll make a list of things that I want to accomplish in the week. Uh, And these are usually hopelessly unrealistic and ambitious lists. And I never finish them. Uh, It's a bit deflating. There's always things that roll over to the next week. Maybe when you don't keep to your diet that you're trying to pursue or you fall behind in a reading plan or you miss a day with exercises or or fitness something. Now, of course, it's not that bad, really. (laughs) There's no relationship with God on the line here. This is just you setting your own goals in different parts of your life. But you probably know that sense of frustration, that sense of disappointment with yourself. This is a really good picture of Israel's history. But then God does something new. Chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, came to earth as a Jewish person. He perfectly fulfilled the law. But then while being perfect and sinless, he accepted this humiliating death. In fact, it was a death that was specified in the law he kept perfectly as being accursed. And so Paul writes that Jesus redeemed or freed us, all people, freed us from the curse of the law by being accursed himself. At his death, Jesus took on the curse that the Jewish people had been labouring under and so brought their cursed state to an end. So therefore, in Jesus, the role of the law in the people relating to God, that comes to an end. Let me say that again. In Jesus, the role of the law in people relating to God comes to an end. So what's left? What's left for the people to relate to God? Well, it's that original promise to Abraham. The promise that God made to make a people through Abraham, a promise that required a response of faith, of belief, not performance. This is important. Paul makes it clear that the era of the law, the era that began with Moses and ran all the way through to Jesus' death, that period has ended. But this law period did not invalidate those promises that God made to Abraham way back, before the law even existed, 430 years before. Those promises were still alive. They were still active. Paul says just because the law was around didn't mean those promises were invalid. He says it's just like a human agreement. Once it's signed and sealed and delivered, it's binding. Those promises were still on the go, no matter what additional agreements like the law were also made. In fact, he writes this, chapter 3, verse 15 and 17. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. The promises were still in place. They were kind of on ice during that period of the law. They were actually waiting for Jesus to come. And now Jesus has come and by his death, he's ended that law era. The promises now come back to the forefront. And Paul says it's these promises that make it clear it's faith, not any ritual, not any performance. Faith is the basis of salvation. The promises to Abraham that specifically looked forward to all sorts of nations and people being brought into God's people. I don't know how you found that. 
little summary, it was fairly complex, I accept. It draws on a lot of Israel's history. Let me attempt a very quick summary for you. Paul is making here a big comparison between two ways of relating to God. One way is belief. Belief in God's promises. That's how Abraham related to God, isn't it? God made promises to Abraham. Abraham's response, it was the right response to a promise. He believed them. He believed what God said would come true. He trusted they'd be fulfilled. The other way of relating to God is performance of God's law. That's how the people related to God from Moses onwards. God laid out laws for them to follow, which required performance, obedience. But then Paul says, Jesus has ended that law way of relating to God. That's over, which just leaves us with the first way that was around before law even existed. That's the way of faith, believing in God's promises. So now Paul says, like Abraham, the response for us today who want to follow God, it's faith, dependent trust, not rituals like some are trying to insist upon Gentile believers. Hopefully this makes a bit of sense. But now I want to talk about what this means for us. And I also want to talk about the movie Chocolat. Chocolat is a lovely French film. Well, it's, it's partly French, from about 2000. Uh, it's about a free-spirited woman who brings life and joy and kind of lots of chocolate to a formal French town bound up by traditions. There's plenty of little subplots in the film, but the one that I think speaks to today's passage is that of the mayor, the Comte de Renard. Comte de Renaud, pardon me. The movie is set during Lent, and Renaud takes Lenten food abstinence very seriously, very strictly. He, he relies on his own ability to be very strict with Lent, and he also looks down upon others who are kind of more indulgent during Lent, to the point that his, his own self-worth and value is based on his self-control. He really prides his own resistance. There's a great scene where I think his maid comes in with freshly brewed coffee in a pot, and he, he allows her to bring it in. I think he lifts the lid, has a sniff of that smell. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, but he just smells the smell, but then closes the lid and asks the maid to take it away. Very kind of proud of his resistance. He didn't have a drop. He was able to resist despite the temptation. He's a great example of self-reliance, someone who relies on their own performance, really, their, their own ability to do resistance well. And in this movie, his Lenten observance really became a law for him. He was committed to keep. But there were two big issues with this. Firstly, it was unnecessary. Now, I don't want to have a go here for anyone who does practice Lenten um, resistance or abstinence, I should say, of any sort during Lent. It's totally up to you. There can be good reasons for that. But clearly the mayor here goes too far. He's linking his own holiness and his own value on his observance of Lenten denial. The second issue is what he was doing was a trap. He put so much stock into this law that he made that he was only holy in his own eyes and probably in the eyes of those he judged. He was only holy for as long as he could keep it up. And look, spoiler alert here, as the movie goes on, near the end, he lapses. He tastes a morsel of chocolate accidentally almost, and then he, he gets hooked. He binges out, he gorges himself, he's found, and he's humiliated. I want to suggest that Reno's story, it's something like Paul's point in this letter about abiding by Jewish customs for salvation. Now that Jesus has brought this to an end, Keeping the law to be in relationship with God is unnecessary. Faith is all that's needed. Paul's really clear. Gentile believers do not need to be following these customs. They just need faith. Keeping the law is unnecessary because Jesus has freed us, redeemed us from law-based relationship with God. And just like in the film, it's a trap. It is a trap. See, if Gentile Christians seek to rely or seek to follow law on top of faith, they've got to rely on it. Suddenly salvation isn't just about relying on what Jesus has done. It's also about relying on your own ability to keep whatever law you've added to the gospel. The heart of it, I think, is chapter 3, verses 9 to 10. Listen to this key comparison. So those who rely... Those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law 
are under a curse, as it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. For Paul, those who wanted to add some parts of law to the gospel, they were now committed to relying on those parts of the law and relying on their fulfillment or performance on it. And so, if and when they failed, maybe they failed to follow a strict food discipline, they were going to suffer shame and despair. Adding law to the gospel, Paul says, it's unnecessary and it's a trap. Well, what about us? What do we rely on? What do we rely on? Do we rely on what Jesus has done for us on the cross alone? Or do we risk relying on something else as well? Some law, something, anything other than God that we rely on to shore up our salvation. Particular things we can do. Things where their success is based on our performance like law. I suspect we might. And I wonder if today there's a couple of groups of people hearing this message. One group of people might be those who actually do add some law or obedience to the gospel. And maybe you've been brought up to believe this way, that some particular, maybe holy activity is kind of part and parcel of your status before God. Maybe it is a devotional practice. And if you you miss a day, your whole relationship with God comes into question. Maybe it's giving to the church that your faithful contributions are actually linked to your salvation in some way. Maybe it's your resistance to certain sins, that your faithful self-control actually kind of combines with Jesus' sacrifice to make you holy in God's eyes. Well, if that's you, if you think you might be in this kind of group, if you can see that you've maybe added something to the gospel that you you want to maintain in order to be saved, I've got really good news from this passage. You're free. You're free. God's love and delight in you as his precious child is not based on your performance or failure, not even a little bit. God's acceptance of you into his eternal kingdom is not put into question if you fail to meet any of those standards you set yourself. You don't need to fear or judge yourself or worry about this. God loves you based on what Jesus has done for you on the cross alone. Jesus' finished work of dying and rising to new life. This and this alone secures our salvation, our freedom, our forgiveness, our relationship as children of God. This is all we need to rely on. Let me encourage you today just to breathe a little deeper and to thank God for his grace. Another group of people listening today, maybe a larger group, might be at risk of relying on something else subconsciously. Not explicitly, of course. You know in your heads and in your declarations that Jesus' work alone is what makes you right with God. But maybe you subconsciously rely on your ability to do something, to feel like you're in relationship with God. I think this is probably the bigger risk and maybe it influences the way, again, we approach certain practices like resisting sin, like daily devotions or giving or church attendance. In your head, you know salvation doesn't depend on those things. You know that. But maybe a little deeper in your heart or something, you, you feel like you're kind of making your contribution to the ledger in some way. You're, you're, you're putting some runs on the board. When you, you, know, you listen to your church service or you attend on Sunday, you, inwardly you think, tick that, I've done, my, I've done my duty today. Or when you finish prayer and Bible reading in the morning or evening, you think, okay, I'm, I'm right with God again for today. Now, you'd never articulate it like that, of course, but there's a subconscious level where you might start to rely on your ability to perform certain practices to be confident on your relationship with God. And if that's you, the message is the same. You're free. You're free. Nothing you can do will contribute to your salvation. Now, let me encourage you to still do those wonderful things, but to do them with joy and freedom rather than duty and pride and despair. Let's read the Bible because we love to hear God's word. Let's pray because we love to call out to God our Father. Let's watch and attend church and worship because we love to learn. We love to worship and celebrate with God's people. Let's give of our finances and of our gifts because we want to contribute to building up God's kingdom in all sorts of ways. And let's not do any of those things in the belief, no matter how subtle, that they play a part in our salvation.
As this part of the letter was written for the Galatians, I, I hope that for us it will also be a reminder of God's grace. The gospel doesn't contain any law. It doesn't require any aspect of performance from us. It's a gospel of grace. And so we don't want to rely on anything that we can do. All we need to rely on is what Jesus has done for us. All we need is faith, dependent trust in what Jesus has done. Through his death and rising again, Jesus has freed us from the need to rely on law. So that like Abraham, it's through faith. It's through faith that we can enjoy God's blessing of relationship with God. Or as Paul writes, he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. Let me pray and thank God. Lord God, we thank you for this wonderful reading from Galatians and this wonderful reminder that we only need to rely on what you've done for us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, I pray that you would help us to avoid relying on anything else that we can do, to avoid that sense of thinking that we've made some contribution to our salvation or that we've failed to make some contribution that we needed to make. Lord, thank you for the message that we are free. We are free because all we need to have is faith in what you've done for us. Whether consciously or subconsciously, Lord, I pray that you would free us from adding any law to the gospel and instead enjoy what it is to have faith in you, faith in you that brings us life and forgiveness and freedom. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.